Um, it's an enormous pleasure to be here and actually to segue from my talk, from what's been previously said, I'm going to be talking about the developing brain. And actually without um, a healthy brain, you can't change behavior and then you can't make a healthy body. So I think that um, what I'd like to tell you today is the astonishing amount of uh, new discoveries that are taking place about the intricacies of early brain development and later too from infancy through teens and how they might be impacting both medicine and society. Now, um, behind me should be showing a uh, time-lapse uh, video of uh, reconstruction, three-dimensional reconstruction actually done by Ellen Grant, who's here, who's a radiologist at Children's, of the brain developing from um, premature infancy to uh, mid-childhood. And as you can see, there's an enormous amount of change going on in terms of the folding of the brain and the structure and the size. And actually, um, this, by the way, couldn't have been done even five to 10 years ago. The technology has developed so much and is allowing us to see the brain actually as a whole and see sort of meta patterns of brain development that might actually predict later life injury. But while you're seeing all this on the outside, actually what's happening on the inside of the brain is even more fascinating. Brain cells will continue to develop and create, and, this, and their connections between brain cells, which are called synapses, are far to go. There's much more development over the lifespan. And those synapses that we have in our brains come in two flavors, excitatory or inhibitory. And actually that is indeed changing over development. Um, as you can see on this graph. And we can actually now study, part of why I get so excited about this, is that we can actually study real human brain with modern cellular and molecular technology so that I can show you an x-axis here of real humans, not animals, and what their synapses are doing. And what you can see here is that excitatory synapses are actually overshooting during development, especially through term, meaning birth, and early childhood, while inhibition takes a very long time to develop actually. And in fact, this is there for a reason. Well, in order for our synapses to connect, they need to be activated. And actually, you need excitation activity to develop new synapses. And we call this period of development the critical period of development. This is when children can effortlessly and annoyingly learn two and three languages perfectly, whereas we bang our heads against the wall as adults to get something down without an accent. Um, there's an enormous amount of learning that takes place um, in this plastic, so-called plastic development, which goes into the teen years, and I'll get to that later. Later. However, this is a double-edged sword because actually there are some diseases that like excitation and one such um, and, and excitatory neurotransmitters which are glutamate receptors and inhibitory neurotransmitters are being used by our brain. Diseases that like more excitation than inhibition uh, can come on in this window, and one of those is epilepsy. Epilepsy is actually a very common and, and under uh, there's not enough awareness about epilepsy. One to two percent of the population has epilepsy, and I'm sure many of your families have been touched by this disease. One in 10 people will have a seizure in their lifetime, and actually the most common time to have, one of the most common times to have epilepsy is during childhood. Five to seven percent of children have epilepsy. I actually study the earliest time point, our most vulnerable patients, the term babies, and you can see there that they have plenty of excitation. We actually study and look for age-specific treatments that reflect the state of their brain, which is wildly different from the adult, as you can see. They're practically a different species. And you can see that it's not reasonable to be giving adult drugs when their receptors are in such different places. Let me tell you that most anti-seizure drug and anti-epilepsy drugs are actually working to promote inhibition. They need GABA receptors as targets to work. And look, the baby brain hardly has any GABA receptors. So go figure, this is very irrational and we're working on that. And we have actually well, the first clinical trial in 60 years using a rational drug based on one of these age-specific therapy ter targets being done in um, kids, in babies right now at Children's. <clears throat> 
Now, what does epilepsy, so we have unique targets. What does epilepsy actually do to the synapse? And I told you about these glutamate receptors, these excitatory synaptic receptors. These are two sides of this connection that brain cells are making with one another on this graph. The blue is the, it, the cell that's gonna send a signal. And you can see here, when you, if you stimulate a cell or you have a, have a thought, um, it should turn on that cell, and then that cell will talk and send transmitter across to the other cell and turn it on. Unfortunately, what's happening with epilepsy is there is just too much of this um, excitation taking place, and that second cell is, has a seizure. That's what a seizure is. It requires too many excitatory synapses. Now, actually, interestingly, as I said to you just now, epilepsy, even in the adult, it turns out this process turns back the clock and actually makes the synapses look more immature. So some of the stuff that we study in babies actually is relevant to epilepsy at any age. And these epileptic brains have more of these immature synapses. We can actually study some of these patients, uh, their actual brains um, in, uh, that come from surgery, because sadly, in 2010, still 40% of people with epilepsy do not get cured by any anti-seizure drug. And some of those patients have to face the most sacrifice, the biggest sacrifice of their lives, which is to give, to have surgery to remove part of the, their brains, and that's to remove the epileptic piece of brain. Now we can take that, those epileptic pieces of brain back to the lab, and we can actually record for them. Here's an example of a fragment, a recording from a fragment of brain tissue removed from a patient with epilepsy, and you can see here those squiggly lines. This brain a uh, piece of tissue was actually still seizing when we got it back to the lab. And this gives an, us an opportunity to test out new drugs on this person's brain cells inside their tissue. And we could also do high throughput screening on this that might actually be useful for this patient and those like them. We can put in new drugs like this one, which actually in this specific slice stop the seizures. Now, Obviously, this is, we can't use these drugs yet, but this is the next best thing to doing a clinical trial, but in a dish. And this is on the actual human tissue itself. Now, this data might be used for people like this patient or, sadly, for maybe in the future, personalized medicine, because very sadly, half of these patients that have epilepsy surgery come back and have seizures again, and it fails. So this might be very important information. Now, another thing that you maybe don't know about epilepsy is that it's not just about the seizures. And I and Susan Axelrod and David Axelrod have been on a campaign through her um, organization, Cure, to say that epilepsy is, is way more than the seizures. And it affects behavior. 50% of people with epilepsy have either cognitive or psychiatric problems. And now why would this be? Well, I showed you that synapse again. And part of this is because epilepsy co-ops are normal mechanisms for learning and memory. It's using the same substrate that makes us human, our thinking. And here's how we learn. This is something called synaptic plasticity, i.e. how the brain molds itself to experience. Here's an example of the, um, the, the stimulus I showed you affecting a brain cell, and there's normally just a response. Now, what if you do a pattern stimulus, such as when you memorize something, really beat it into your brain? Well, that actually sets off a cascade of events that eventually builds and builds and builds this synapse such that when you hit it again with just that one stimulus, you actually get a much bigger response in that second cell. And you can see there that the synapse has actually grown in size, and that's synaptogenesis, and that's long-term potentiation, meaning potentiating making synapses stronger. Sadly, of course, epilepsy makes this happen. Now, if I'm saying anything to you at all that's new today, you guys are at stage B and C, um, and so your synapses in your hippocampi are actually growing real estate for you as we speak, even you adults. <laughs> Um, so this is, uh, interestingly, epilepsy, of course, takes you as a shortcut right to the max. And what can the synapse do now? It's already been ma maxed out by epilepsy. Hence, maybe this is part of why people have cognitive problems. So 
Um, epilepsy, actually, uh, with respect to cognition, there's a very interesting interaction that we can think of. Um, there's an increased incidence of depression in epilepsy. There's an increased incidence of um, many other uh, ADD and other uh, cognitive problems in epilepsy. There is also an increased incidence of autism. And in autism, 40% of patients with autism have epilepsy. Yet nobody talks about this. And we became very interested in this, because it had to do with the developing brain, as why would this be? And it turns out that actually epilepsy and autism look like they're converging on this pathway. One of the many commonalities, I'm sure there are many more, are that they're converging on this pathway. And so we, as I showed you, epilepsy will cause an abnormal synapse. Well, guess what? That little cascade you're seeing here, multiple other places on this cascade, proteins that are um, actually, uh, that are targets that are, gene, that are represented by genes that were known to be causes of autism, all in, stippled in this pathway. So autism, all of those orange dots are, are autism syndromes that are actually use the same proteins as epilepsy does. So what if epileptic seizures might make autism worse? By actually dysregulating some of these pathways? Or can autism teach epilepsy something? And maybe epileptic seizures is giving us a clue to some of the things that epilepsy dis you know, dysregulates even in non-autism patients. So these are ideas that you can have when you look at you know, disease at the, at the level we can in real human tissue. Now, Enough of this. That was my, that's what I do for a day job. But meanwhile, while I was doing this, unbeknownst to me, there was another experiment going on in my own home. My two teen sons. Now, how many of you in this audience have one of these, this species living under your roofs? Great. So you will definitely get what I'm saying here. So I would marvel at their antics of what they were doing, how my two sons, one who was very bright, an A student, seemed to be, despite getting A's, could not seem to understand the rules of the road in Massachusetts, despite the fact it was written in the proverbial sixth grade language. Um, and what about my, the disorganization that these guys had? Um, what was that pile in the bedroom? Was it compost or laundry? Very unclear. And I, I just um, have, I was just marveling, and marveling would be the polite word, tearing my hair out perhaps, and I decided that's it, I have the wherewithal, I'm gonna go back and learn about the teen brain. And in so doing, I discovered there's an enormous amount of neglect of the teen brain as a life stage by medical literature, and only in the last decade have we seen an enormous amount of um, new information about the teen brain. Now you can see that teens are on the shoulder of this rapid learning, which makes them very rapid learners. So do not ever, ever, ever challenge your teenager to a game of memory. You will not be happy with the result. Um, but this is a, like the baby brain, there's an analogy because it's a double-edged sword. And you can see here that teenagers, of course, have a lot more of the machinery to make synapses than adults do. And this actually is, leads to some very interesting and new um, findings. And that is that they can actually get things that they need to know about. They can actually get addicted faster, longer, and stronger than we adults can because they have better synaptic plasticity. And recent research in neuroscience has shown that addiction is a form of learning and memory. It shares a lot in common, which is something I think teenagers need to know, and they do not know this information. I have gone out with some of the information, I'm gonna just a couple more pieces of information I'm gonna tell you today, to start giving lectures to teenagers in their high schools. And as Dick Knox of NPR put it, this is my missionary work I do in high schools. Um, there are other interesting facts, I'll just share a couple with you that are somewhat alarming. Alcohol, actually, which affects the synapses there, um, because there's more synaptic material to affect, kids, in, uh, teenagers with binge drinking will have greater brain damage than adults. Likewise, uh, marijuana, or THC, um, affects uh, numerous places in this pathway, and because they have more substrate, their, their uh, effects are more long-lasting. In fact, it can last after getting high. There can be four days of cognitive impairment. So it suggests that, you know, what's gonna happen on that test on Thursday when you've had a busy weekend? Um, these are things these kids need to know. Um, <laughs> and then finally, stress, which is a whole other thing, actually modulates learning and memory and cognition, and also psychiatric state, obviously, 
obviously, and it's been known that they're more plastic, more vulnerable to stress, that the same amount of stress in a teenager can actually, that does little to an adult can actually cause an increased risk of depression later in life. So there's an enormous amount of information coming out of this stage of development. So then to some, the other part of this is that in addition to these synaptic plasticity, we have um, the connections between the paradoxes that while they're learning really fast, the connections between different brain regions are not as fast as adults. And here's an example um, showing how the brain connects up over life, and you can see on the left that uh, the blue areas are with connected parts of brain, and you can see that it's going um, from the back to the front. Um, so the back of the brain, which is at the bottom of the slide, to the top is the frontal lobes, which are the last to connect. And what do you think the frontal lobes do? They are the seat of our insight, judgment, and impulse control. Need I say more? This process is not done till 20. And look there on the bottom at that age 20, there's a couple of blue, green spots still. And men, males, actually uh, are about two to three years behind females. So that might have been a male. But we really didn't need neuroscience to tell us that, did we? Um, so finally, just to sum this, wrap this up, is that uh, w this is a fascinating amount of information that's coming out that applies to medicine and society. Um, infancy is a time of increased synaptic learning. It is, of course, plateaus super high in childhood. Teens are still great. We're sort of at a plateau. We don't want to talk about what happens next. But um, connectivity is actually coming up. And actually, at the frontal lobes are the last to come online, which explains a lot of the paradox of the teenage brain, and also suggests that we adults are leaner and meaner. So I would just like to um, close then with hoping that I've given you a sense of um, how the the information coming out of the developing brain is really important with respect to medicine and telling us about no more hand-me-down drugs to the developing brain. Some really important things about um, epilepsy is a perfect example of a disease that actually we can learn a lot from the developing brain. There's recapitulation of those patterns even in adult epilepsy patients. And finally, how this this teen, like th this information about neuroscience isn't getting out to society fast enough. And I think those teenagers, we need to think about how are they going to get this information. I can't go to every high school and give a talk. I am writing a book, but that's still, they're not going to read that. Only the parents are going to read it. So um, I think we have a charge to try to get neuroscience out there, especially in the developing brain, because without a, develop a healthy de young brain, you can't have a healthy adult brain. Thank you. <laughs>